Hello. Hey, hey Juliet, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, good. Uh, today we're going to talk about, is the school system ready for meaningful change? Um, and I guess, I guess I want to start with you. Um, and I want to say, I like, you know, I found your page and I found some, like the videos that you do are really cool and they're like short little blips um, of like really thought provoking questions sometimes. Uh, and I really appreciate that. Um, what, what brought you to this point where, you know, you know, you had some questions about schooling and, and, you know, you started moving towards self-directed learning. So I have three children and I'm a ravenous reader. And from the moment they first daughter was born, I just started like eating books for breakfast. And I also, at the time that I first became a mom, I was working at a landscape architecture office and uh, I'm a very creative person. So it was cool to be in that environment, but um, I had a lot of disillusionment there. Like I had a very wealthy person like call and scream on the phone because their dogwood tree had like pink flowers instead of white flowers. like very we're talking like really uber wealthy people like people that spend millions of dollars on the landscaping for their hamptons homes and like yes. and house terraces so i started thinking of a career switch and i switched to teaching and the first schools that i worked at i had had some experiences doing like school programming and like private tutoring and things like that my sister also um works in education so I had a bit of a background and I started to teach art at um, a charter school. And that first year of the charter school, the first charter I worked at was so traumatizing. I was just talking the other day about a kindergarten classroom. I was helping on the first day of school and this little boy who had an IEP that said he had a speech and language delay and at one point during the first day of school, he had like a bit of a tantrum at the end of the day and the teacher in that classroom couldn't get him to be quiet. So she started to like shame him in the hopes of silencing him and literally said like, do you cry this way at home? I bet your parents are ashamed of you. So that traumatized me. I like, once I had worked in schools, I like the more I read, the more I was like, oh, my gosh, what we're doing is like the exact opposite of what the latest science in all of these parenting and teaching books says. And sometimes we would have even have professional development sessions that touched briefly on the latest science. And I'm like, don't any of you guys see how this contradicts this policy that we just enacted or this approach we're doing? So I just had so much disillusionment and anger, but I couldn't imagine not working full time. And then COVID hit yeah. and changed that. It was like both me and my husband trying to teach with two kids full time from home and it was impossible. So I left, um, I helped co-write a homeschooling curriculum and now today I'm not working and I'm just, I finally got the courage to like say all the things that were floating around in my head that whole time I was teaching because I'm not, you know, beholden to them anymore. And I have so many, I have my kids young. I have so many friends who are just having kids now. And I think that there's like a real crisis happening. I think teacher, te everybody knows it. Everyone knows there's like such a crisis in our schools um, and we need to be talking about it because it's going to get worse <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. I, I feel like, uh, you know, educational science versus what actually happens in school is such a common theme. Uh, and I always go back to, um, we talked about this before with, how roughly, you know, it takes like 30 years for educational science to like filter down into schools. But I still think there's like, 
relics of like 1950s in our schools and like widespread. I'm not just talking about like little here and there. I'm talking about like hardcore behaviorism type stuff. Um, and just some of the systems that we're stuck under. Um, it, it, what's your experience with that? I agree with you. I think, um, I didn't mention this earlier, but I got um, my master's in education research last year. And something else is that when we, when we talk about science, um, there are past uh, advocates of progressive education who put to words things that we now have the studies to support. Mm -hmm. But saying this for decades, decades and decades and decades, like Montessori is 100 years old, right? Like people who closely observe children and like literally just watch like what is working and what is not working most of this stuff you don't need a scientific study to tell you what's not working like some of the days where i was in school where there were just so many power struggles and like the sound of kids screaming in the hallways when recess is over and the stress in the teachers voices like it doesn't take a genius to recognize that that's not healthy you know yeah. that that's like like when that's every single day like when you come off of your job feeling like you just got hit by a bus like every day that's not uh, how can that possibly be good for you and for the kids like it can't be and it's not and we're seeing the effects of it now like mass people quitting mass shootings um people complaining that the kids have attitudes that nobody wants to learn like kids don't come out of the womb disillusioned with life yes. they don't, not like that when they yeah. first walk in through the door so we are cultivating that mm -hmm. and i think some of us are in denial about it or a lot of times it's not the teachers that are in denial it's it's um it's money and politics and that it's yeah <laughs> right. A lot of us have known for so long what could make it better, and we don't have the capacity to make the changes necessary. And that that friction that you're talking about, uh, paired with the disillusionment, I feel like that's something that's normalized in society, right? Um, and we're, we're just used to that. And we just keep on trucking and like teachers too, like, you know, they take the brunt of that and they're like, you know, I just have to, I have to deal with this because this is my life and this is what I signed up for. Um, and it, it stinks. What, what do you feel like, let's talk about specifically what you feel like needs to change in schools. Uh, we can like cherry pick, grab a couple things. Uh, obviously this is not going to be like an exhaustive list. Um, what do you think? What are some big things that need to change? I think we have so much research now that shows the, the effects of like physical and mental well-being on cognitive health. And I feel like a lot of schools aren't paying attention to our physical and mental well-being to the extent that they should. Like kids should not be outside running around for only 25 minutes of the day. Neither should adults. Like we evolved to be doing that for the vast majority of the day. Right. Um, we need more movement. Um, I think we need smaller schools. I think again, going back to evolution, like we evolved in these communities in these bands, but when you go to a school that has like a thousand students, you can't possibly know everybody that's there. And maybe there is a place for that, like at the college level, right? Mm -hmm. but elementary school, I really think like children need to be known. And teachers also, like if you have a really stressful job and the turnover rate is so high and you like barely know your colleagues, that's going to impact yeah. you and impact the kids also. So I think more movement, smaller schools, and I think kids need way more autonomy. Um, yes. Somebody on one of my TikToks just said, like, 
they, they commented something so perfect. It was like, it's hard to follow the child if you're trying to follow the standards. Um, the standard yeah. testing have limited our ability to do progressive things because there might be learning gaps, right? We might not check all the boxes if we let a kid go down a rabbit hole about dinosaurs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't get to the SH diagraph today and we didn't, you know, kids still, you can still have like really solid instruction on literacy and math, but not feel like you have to get through all of this material. And that's the thing too is like, in the stress of trying to get through it all, we just do a poor job. It's like, do you know what I'm saying? Like the, you glaze over it. Yeah. So it's not deep learning. So it's like, okay, you, yeah, you checked the boxes, but now we forgot half of the boxes because we only spent one 30 minute class period on a box and half the class wasn't here because it was like the day after Halloween. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just rushing through all of this stuff. The te it, it stresses the teachers. It stresses the kids. Um, I think. Autonomy, um, which means like in order to do that, we need to lower the amount of standardized tests and lower the pressure on teachers to follow the standards to a T and check all of those boxes. More time for movement, a bigger focus on mental health and, and smaller schools. Those would be my priorities. Those, it's there's, a lot. there's some really <laughs> good ones. Um, one thing that you said, like, we set the bar so low for mental health in schools that we're like, we're not even meeting the minimum of like, let's have kids like have mental health enough to to be able to memorize stuff to take in learning you know what i mean and if that's the bar that we're setting a we're not meeting that bar and b our bar should be way higher than that it should be like focused on the whole child and like looking out a few years how is this going to affect them if we're pushing so hard in kindergarten how are they going to be in and, and again there are studies on this right um and yeah the sense too to the kids that like oh you passing this test is more important than your happiness right now yeah you know, i believe in like trying to motivate kids to do difficult things and persevere but we had kids for example that were you know in foster care and would go into like fight or flight multiple times sorry the baby is like playing with toys right underneath me is it really loud yeah. um you know they they would just you could literally see their face transform when they went into like a dark place right yeah it happened multiple times during the school day and then if they like ran out of the classroom or something your job if you were the person responding i was one of those people i was like on our culture team because we didn't have the budget to hire more people so they made like the art and the music teacher and everybody do it yeah. um i'm really happy i got to do that actually um because i got to bond with like the most difficult kids but our our job was always to just like get them back on task as quickly as we possibly could like let's get this person back to their practice test yeah I'm like, okay, well, every time you tell this kid that there's going to be a practice test, they fall apart. Like, and they're dealing with so much trauma at home. Like, is this practice test that important? Even for kids that like, the particular student I'm thinking of right now was like one of the most well-read students in the class. Like they were very, which is unusual for kids with such a massive trauma background. So it's not even like they were behind and needed to catch up. It was just like, no, we have to set the same expectation for all the kids, like the no excuses kind of mindset that happens at some of these schools. Like, oh, if we don't make them do everything that the other kids are doing, that means we're not holding them to the high bar. It means we are giving up on them and like giving them excuses and being permissive. It's like, no, I just want this child. They don't have a safe place at home. 
So how can we create a feeling of safety for them here? Me forcing them to do this practice test isn't doing it right now. I can see it in their face. So what can we do? But people aren't, they don't want to have that conversation. <laughs> yeah, I think that man, so much in what you said, I, I have like a response to um, the, the like how school is completely not individualized. Um, I have a great word for that. And the word is Procrustean. I don't know if you've heard this word before, Procrustean. but it means basically that it comes from Procrustus. Uh, I think he was like in mythology and he was this guy that would, you know, he was kind of a maniac, a crazy guy, and he would kidnap people and make him fit a certain metal bed, right? If they were too big for the bed, he would lop off some limbs and if they were not big enough for the bed he would stretch them and so you know as crazy as that sounds but it fits perfectly to what school is. got this very box and it wants everybody to fit inside this box and not any larger and not any smaller and it's so unforgiving like i think that's the best word to really say it's really unforgiving for how wildly different kids minds are and how their behaviors are and you know what they're interested in and that's such a shame um and another thing you were talking about is like time to ask and i felt like like i was triggered I said that because i i was like i was transported right back to my time in the classroom where the focus on anybody with a behavioral problem, right but like what counts as on task and why are we only saying that this learning that we have, you know, sanitized and delivered to the classroom is okay? And how come we haven't spent any time thinking about the invisible learning that happens in like a multitude of other interesting things that could be going on? And that like, I think that's one of the things that I think needs to change is an understanding that learning happens even if it can't be documented. Right. And I don't know if that's an easy change. We're talking about politics. Really, anything that has changed in schools was documented, you know, in, in a certain way. But I don't know if anybody would be OK with ever moving in that direction unless we're talking about long, like longitudinal studies. Right. I don't know. Say what? Re repeat your question. I didn't understand your question. There's a, there's a lot in there, but I guess what I'm saying is that will we ever see school allowing for invisible learning? Will we ever see school that does, isn't so focused on outcomes? Right? I think, I think the, in terms of like the latest science trying to take hold, I think the more we educate, not just educators, but parents, about some of these things, you know, making change is super, super hard. But look what, you know, far right conservatives did to textbooks in the matter of, you know, two years since Black Lives Matter, and we've like, banned all of these textbooks, right for CRT. So change is possible if you, I've, that's why I make these videos for parents, because I want parents to be outraged, I don't think parents, like I don't think the parent of that little boy in kindergarten had any idea what his first day of kindergarten is, was like. He literally didn't have, he had a speech delay. He couldn't have even described it to his mom if he had wanted to. Mm. And me too, I was like complicit in a way too because she was my cop go to the parent after school and be like, oh, this woman like traumatized your son on the first day of kindergarten. Right. Or we can, you know, especially because the student mental health issue is getting, it's hitting such an alarming state, you know, teen gun violence surpass like car accidents and teen suicide keeps going up. I think the more parents you have being like, holy shit, like we really have to do something, um, the more change is possible. And in terms of the invisible learning, like thinking about that, that girl and that situation where I had to keep trying to get her to do her practice tests. Mm -hmm. um, I wish a psychologist or again, I wish I had had the guts um, 
to sit down with like some of the people in charge of her like plans and be like, okay, this girl knows how to read. The biggest thing that's going to hold her back in life is her trauma, is her going into fight or flight. If we invested in her social emotional learning and health and her ability to recognize her triggers and like bring herself out of that state, that is literally the most important thing we could have been worried about. Um, and I do think that more, the more we talk and the more brain science becomes disseminated amongst the public, the more people will be able to recognize that. But again, we have to deal with the testing because it's the hysteria over the testing uh -huh. that, that squelches that, right? Because even if I invested all that time in supporting her mental health, if they are like, oh, well, she got a 50% on the math state test, blah, 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 blah. Like, that's the only thing that matters to them, which is absurd. It's like, my God, what if she's not a mathematician, but she can actually, like, function in relation? Like, wouldn't that be helpful? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that brings up a good point. Um what I mean, what if we drop testing? And I don't know, what if we drop testing for everybody in elementary school, there was no testing, aren't I feel like there are countries that largely do this. Um, at this point, I, I know, I, I think Finland doesn't test till middle school, I want to say, my friend Lauren joined, she may know. Um, I don't know. I know that a lot of places don't test unless it's like every other year. I do think we could significantly test. Do I think that politicians will eliminate it from elementary school? Probably not. Um, but if we can't completely eliminate the tests, what we could at least do is like not pair funding with funding. Yeah. Um, and kind of like I tell people to decenter school at home, like decenter testing in schools. Right now it is the center of especially charter schools, at least in New York, because that's you don't get your license renewed unless you show gains on the tests. <laughs> One second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Reminds me, um, it circles back to what you were saying. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> it circles back to what you were saying earlier. Um, like the, the mile wide inch deep curriculum that we're doing. And if we're only focusing on what's on the test, then we're just reinforcing that system that everybody knows doesn't work. Right. Um, so yeah, I feel like testing, dropping testing would be amazing if it was possible. Um, and I think textbooks as well, in a, in a large portion. Um, and if we're talking about autonomy, autonomy would mean, for me, maybe you have something else to say about this, but for me, it would mean only taking a course or focusing on a subject if you wanted to, right? And I know the implications, of, like, you know, how difficult that is to accomplish in a school, large school, right? Um, and not like, you know, you don't have a textbook. It's not like this is math hour. Like, well, what do you want to focus on today? Or what do you want to focus on now? Um, what are your thoughts on that? So I think textbooks are a resource. I think any like really great teacher, if it's you're just doing everything the textbook says to do, you're not a great teacher and I think most of them know that. Um, I think, I do think we need to provide a lot more autonomy for students. And I do think like you can do things like, for instance, the last school I worked in had <clears throat> PE, music, art, dance. What if you had like a month where you try all of them mm -hmm. and then afterward you get to choose because I hear the argument all the time that kids should be exposed to things like, and if we don't force them, they won't ever even be introduced to them. Okay. I think there's some validity to that. Um, you know, especially 
there are kids who just novel things scare them, you know, and so they might never choose any, like, like the kid that only wants to eat white bread, you know, um, this is, this is the, the area I told you that like, <laughs> I get a little murky with unschooling because, um, I believe in giving students a lot more autonomy. The thing is to, un I'm, I hope this is not a bunch of word vomit, but I think most unschoolers actually like some people will join an, a radical unschooling Facebook group and then be scared away by like someone that's like, my kid doesn't want me to brush their hair. And now they have like a bunch of matted dreads and I don't know if it's like, oh my God, like please brush your child's hair. Um, but I feel like most unschoolers are not like that. They're actually, they are very reasonable and they will be like, oh, you know, like I noticed that they're not really exposing themselves to this. I'm going to try and do it in a strategic way to mm -hmm. it in a way where they might be more like I left a, a workbook that's like two years old out for my kid the other day. And two years ago when I tried her to get to do it, she had zero interest. And then I left it out and she, she just did it for funsies now. Right. Um, so I think you can expose children to different things without, you know, even if it's like, oh, come to the dance class, you don't have to join. You know, if you feel like dancing in front of others is humiliated, I'm not going to force you. But just. Yeah. Um, but how does that look in school, though? I think that's this is where we hit this, like, you know, this gray area of, you know, if we're like, OK, we want to expose children to a bunch of different things for this month. And again, I'm like all for things like what you're talking about strewing where you like, okay, you know, just I'm going to leave these things out. And if you're interested, do it or not. Um, but I feel like in school, like it's really hard to let go of any amount of coercion in terms of like, okay, we're doing dancing this month. So everybody grab a partner. Do you know what I mean? No, I, I mean, it's like, uh, you could do like a rotation. Um, I'm thinking about the literal class schedule. So I did, I had an art camp or not camp. I had an art after school club. Um, and so did the music teacher, the dance teacher, the gym teacher. And it, it was first come first serve. And my club was the most popular, not to brag too much, but it was kind of like that where like everybody had already in school taken everybody's classes. And from there they decided like, Oh, I want to sign up for this club. Um, it gets tricky if you run out of spots in the most popular one, but that also kind of incentivizes teachers to serve the kids more. Like how do you get more kids interested in your class? Maybe nobody picked your class cause it's not fun. Um, and then, so we had age mixing in there in the club. I did K to four which was awesome. And then um, it was a choice based room. I did tab education teaching for artistic behavior. So I had like different stations set up. And I would start a club or a class by giving a demo of a specific material, whether that was like weaving, or I did like a watercolor demo, whatever it was. And then the kids could either choose to like, oh yeah, that weaving stuff, that looks cool, I wanna do that, or not, you know, and not do that. And I didn't force them, they, they decided they wanna do drawing that day. So that's an example of giving kids a lot of autonomy while still exposing them to different things and not forcing them. Now, are, were there times when kids like just didn't wanna be in art club that day? Yeah. Um, you know, that's part, like, people who are kind of against unschooling or SDE will be like, well, we are, we all have to do things we don't like in life. So right. we should learn, like, um, I don't think that means you have to, like, force them to go to school and be miserable. But it's not untrue. That's like, okay, if you're going to be part of this community, this community has rules. Um, my daughter's school, they have community agreements, right, where the kids literally like they sit down and have a discussion about why they want to practice math and literacy every day. And then the kids sign off on it. They're like, Oh yeah, you're right. Like maybe we should be able to like do basic math and read and they consent mm -hmm. um, to doing that yeah. day to day. Does sometimes the kids backtrack? Yes. 
Like they're like, oh, I didn't actually want, I wanted to keep doing this. Um, that is still, even if you're against that, that is so closer, so much closer to a humane and like pleasurable way of teaching and learning than what we have right now. Yeah. So I don't think it's ever going to be perfect for everyone. Um, but I think we can get a lot closer to, to children having autonomy and a say over what they're doing and, and enjoying school that much more as a result. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and I want to, I want to circle back to something that you said earlier, um, much earlier where like smaller schools, that sounds really difficult. Especially if we're talking about like in cities where, you know, it's not so easy to just the infrastructure to, to make that possible. Um, right? um, but also like the, I think we've moved as a society to a place where we're more concerned with networks. And uh, we see this a lot with like our workspaces where, you know, we treat the people that we work for say we're a team and we need to be together and we're like a family but really we're like a network we're, we're nothing like a family we're connected because <laughs> you know what i mean or and this is the best way that has helped us up to this point it doesn't necessarily mean that we're like supporting each other to the best of our abilities um it doesn't mean that we're looking out for everybody it just means like for a large portion, like if we're just talking about like US base, a large portion of us are kind of getting by and doing the least minimum to get the highest possible amount, you know? I, and I know maybe I'm just, maybe I'm speaking from my perspective, but I feel like a lot of Americans are jaded in that way that we're just like, okay, let me just get done and let me fly under the radar. And sure, if I'm shooting for a promotion, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go 75%, but generally I'm, I'm sticking at like 50%. And don't get me wrong, like when I think about teachers, I think about the crazy amount of like 100% that they put in for like 150% of the time that they should be in school, right? Um, so this is not like, this doesn't apply to everybody, but I feel like largely people are kind of passing it for way too long. What are your thoughts on that? So everything is everything, right? Like we have these nuclear family homes and this very individualistic culture. Um, that like you said, it's like, oh, I'm just trying to do minimal effort for maximal output. But I think COVID helped a lot of people realize that that wasn't working. Like so many people lost their jobs or got rid of their commute and they're like, holy shit, I'm happier. Yeah. Right? Like I was one of those people. I would never have quit my job if COVID hadn't forced my hand. And now I'm like, oh, I'm never, never doing that ever. Oh my gosh. No, 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 no. I was like, I was a chicken with their head cut off. Like by the time I got home to see my own kids, I, my, my. Um, oh no, Dan. Is that me? Am I breaking up? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, yeah, my, my ability to regulate myself by the time I got home from work was gone. So I was very impatient with my own children. And then I would feel really guilty about that. Um, so I do think more people are coming to the realization that the way we've built our society is not working for us. Um, we've been sold a lie that like, oh, you move away from your parents to go to college and then you can have your own house. Um, but it's like, okay, well now you have your own house and you're raising your kids by yourself and you're miserable. And you <laughs> then because you have to work two full-time jobs um, in order to pay for the house and the car that gets you there. Like, 
more and more people are starting to realize that that's the case. Um, the question is for me, hang on, I'm going to give her my booby and put the phone down. Oh no. Oh no. The question for me is like, what are we willing to try and what, um, what is politically feasible? Because for instance, with the smaller school things, what if you, what if you provided grants for micro schools, but you tried to do it in a way that, uh, gave money to like the, the poorest communities and empowered those people and like, and brought in like, okay, if you still want some state oversight or whatever, government oversight, what if you had experts like from the district that coached these teacher leaders and did observations and like collected data from the parents about their satisfaction? Like, do they like this better than they liked the old school and why? Um, if I feel like <laughs> uh, that proposition is something like teachers unions might be hysterical over. Um, it's, it's, yeah, politically, we've made like public versus more options, a very black and white issue, where to me, it shouldn't be like, our public schools have gotten really like bloated to the point where we're just so disconnected. And it's part of the community disconnection. The idea that it's so commonplace that you just, you are with your kids and then they hit kindergarten and you just hand them over to a giant building full of strangers that you don't know. And that is so normal um and now today we have it so that you do that and sometimes your kid doesn't come home like excuse me um yeah freaking it's it's horrible um we are so we really need to reconnect with our communities we need to like know who our neighbors are we don't know the people we're sitting next to on the bus that we see every single day. Um, and we're all just like retreating to our, to our like-minded circles on, on apps like these, <laughs> you know, finding, finding community on here is great too, but I can't like, when I'm out of eggs, I can't go knock on your door and ask to borrow some, right? Like I have to get in my gas guzzling car and drive across town so I can get like three eggs and because I'm so uncomfortable just talking to my own neighbor. Uh, yeah. I think the status quo of like being in networks versus being in a community um, is, gonna, is gonna be really hard to break. And sure, like the pandemic happened and it's still happening, right? And there has been some shifting, but it has it been like a largely a paradigm shift has, has or ha have we just returned back to like fairly- you know, there, Dan. Try what's up? I'm trying to stay positive, Dan. <laughs> but, no, like we've gone back to like business as usual for the most part, which is, it's breaking my heart. like. It definitely has reduced my faith in humanity's capacity to change. I'm like, oh, really? Like, you guys were just talking about this other stuff. Um, yeah, you just you just gave us money for like six months in a row, and now that stopped. You know, because because we don't need masks anymore or something. I do. <laughs> um, let's talk about. Julia, let's talk about barriers. Like what's holding us back? And we've mentioned politics so far, and like that's an obvious one. And to get more specific on politics itself, I would say I would say lobbying, right? Like textbook lobbying, testing lobbying, like what other I feel like technology, we can throw that in there, right? Um, that's holding us back from significant change. Is there, 
do you feel like, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think that there are other things that are barriers to us, you know, reforming school in a positive way for everybody? Um, so one of the biggest complaints against charter schools is like the amount of corruption. Um, but when people make that complaint, I'm also like, you know that there's corruption with public school districts too, right? Like public schools get these massive contracts to testing companies, to textbook companies. Why is it like, if we're gonna test this shit out of all our kids, can our own government be responsible for it? Like if we're gonna pay anyone, can we like add the tax dollars back into our own government instead of we pay tax dollars for schools and they're essentially funneled to private testing companies. Pearson manages a bunch of our testing companies, isn't even a US company. They're a British company. Oh, really? Oh my goodness. Yeah, like, so we're literally giving like millions and millions of dollars to a company that doesn't necessarily employ that many US citizens. How crazy is that? It's like, yeah. it's mind boggling. Um, so, and that's public and charter. It's not just charter schools. With charters, I feel like it's even more uh, rampant maybe, like, because anyone can just open one if you can get the contract, right? Like if you, if your buddy is with, you know, whoever sits on the board of like the map testing company or whatever, mm -hmm. like tell them like, hey, I'm thinking about opening this charter school. Do you want to like hand me a bunch of money and I'll open it and then we're going to buy your test um, and use it for all of the grades. Like this shit's happening. Like that's real. And it's our public do dollars all in the name of like supposedly making kids smarter, but we're not actually doing that. Um, right. So, yes. So one barrier is definitely the politics and the and the dirty money. Mm. Um, another barrier is um, our ourselves and our schoolishness. Yes. Um, I think I made I made a video where I said, even if you made like all of the kindergartners, all the kindergarten classrooms like more developmentally appropriate tomorrow or pre-K or 3K, you would have a bunch of angry parents who have been trained into thinking that if you're not forcing kids to trace letters and numbers, then they're not learning. Um, our own school system has created those people. We've, like people literally think learning is like sitting down and looking at a book. Um, and we've spent decades devaluing soft skills, devaluing the arts, devaluing parenthood, like how important this job is. Or like, I remember when I was a kid thinking like, I don't wanna be a stay at home mom. Like what kind of job is that? How could that be fulfilling? Right, right. where's the money in that? Exactly. So we need like what you're doing and what I'm trying to do is spread the word to more parents because I also went into teaching with a very kind of schoolish mindset. Um, and it, and it took me watching my own kids. And like, I made a video the other day about like, sometimes your baby just like decides they're going to learn something that day. Like, they're just like, I'm going to learn to walk today. And like, you cannot stop them. I mean, you can physically if you wanted to limit them. Um, the other day, oh, Nalu was like, oh, I wanna learn how to pull up to stand. Anytime I put her on the ground to crawl around, she would go to like the nearest thing that she could grab onto to try and pull up to stand. Yeah. I didn't coerce her, you know? And you can say that, oh, well, there's a difference between that and reading because they can like, you know, um, they're biologically wired to do that. And maybe we're not biologically wired to read. Um, but I do think, I think every kid, if they see like, oh, this is how you get clout. Um, this is how you get respect from others. This is how you learn things. Of course, they're going to want to do it. You would have to be stupid to not want to. The question is, are we capable of providing them the resources? Um, to help them do it, right? Especially, I think there is a, a bit of a problem with um, uh, 
parents unschooling or homeschooling neurodivergent kids when they don't know that they are neurodivergent, they don't know the signs, or they don't know how to help them and they're like unwilling to get resources. I think there are some people that are like, no, the diagnosis is just, you know, we're just labeling kids and it's like, okay, well, dyslexia is a real thing, um, I think. Dyslexia is real. Um, and if your child has dyslexia and you don't know how to teach them to read, you should probably get help. And if you have no idea how to figure out if they're dyslexic, you should probably get help. Um, I think that just goes with like, okay, A, connection with your kids and B, supporting them to be the best that they can. If you're missing that, then you're, you're missing it, right? You know what I mean? Uh, that, that's crappy, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean in all cases that you need a teacher to teach reading to your kid. In some cases, reach out to your, again, we're talking about community here and say, well, we're struggling with this. He's interested in reading, but he can't, you know, what, what options have you used? You know? Um, yeah, I said get, I don't, yeah, it's, get help could mean many things. It could mean that you learn how to, you get your own Orton Gilligan certificate, like, you know, there are all different ways that you can, you, that's what's so great about unschooling is like learning while your kid learns, like. Yeah. So, and another thing I want to talk about is coercion in school um, to the extent, coercion happens in school to the extent that intrinsic motivation is largely drained out of children. And so when their children are only looking for extrinsic motivation, like rewards or punishments coming from outside of them, then to just switch over to a point where you're like, hey, follow what interested in kids are like what what do you mean you know what I mean and so this gets into a little of de-schooling de which in my understanding in my experience is actually way easier for kids but if it's the adults that are designing the system we're the ones that have a lot more years of like de-schooling that you know schooling that we need to like kind of drain out of us and let go um, and that's, I feel like that's another one of the barriers is that the adults that are designing the system are often the ones that are, you know, most harmed by it and, and deep in the system, if that makes sense. I'm not even, I'm not entirely sure that that is true. I think there are a lot of schoolish teachers, but I was shocked when I was a teacher, like, how many of my colleagues were like, I hated reading growing up. And like, I sucked at school. I was like, really? And you're here because, you know? Um, but I do, what you just pointed out in terms of the de-schooling process, that's one of the reasons that, that so many higher ups and admin will, will go against like a choice-based classroom, like what I did, because so many kids will just be like, I don't know what to do. Right. You know, and they don't have the patience to see what happens over time. Like in a few, that tab classroom that I started really needed, like most tab professionals who have like done it for years will say like, oh, you need like five years of that program to like really see what kids can do. Because you're right. They like, even just like, Somebody commented on my video recently saying like, when I was talking about tabs saying like, oh, I would have hated that because I wasn't creative at all. I needed to be told what to do. And I'm like, but you just, I don't believe that creativity is just this innate skill. Well, I mean, children are innately creative, but in terms of like coming up with an idea and executing it, you, that's, that's a trained, that's, you can cultivate that. Right. Like, it, you sucked at it then, but maybe if you had been given enough support enough times, you wouldn't. And again, that's like a very difficult thing to measure, which is why administrators are like, reading, like learning isn't happening because all I know is that this kid had a hard time coming up with an idea and their thing looks like crap, you know, like that's, 
<laughs> but it's like, but they came up with an idea. Right. You know? And maybe the next one will look better and maybe not, but maybe just the fact that they did anything is is an achievement, you know? Right. I think that's that's one of the things that we struggle with is that like what's needed to to help the adults in that era in that uh, situation is the de-schooling of like what is progress here, right? And I, I think when we disagree on de-schooling, I think it's just a disagreement on what counts as like what's the definition of de-schooling, um, because when you have like teachers that were like, I hated reading as kids. Why did they, hate but they were push to read? So now they're in the mindset that like they were bad or they weren't good enough at that age. Do you know what I mean? So I think that is included in that whole de-schooling um, definition for me at least. And that's something that they need to like go back to their childhood, whether it's trauma or wasn't, you know, or, or just like an uncomfortable situation and realize that the perspective that you are taught isn't necessarily the true perspective, if that makes sense. Um, and I also think one thing I'm thinking about is that schools definitely don't have the best interests of the kids. And I worked at a pretty progressive school. Um, it was a, a, it was like infant to kindergarten, right? Uh, so largely a preschool. And we were focused on the child's interest. That's how we were making the curriculum. The curriculum was happening on a, um, like the teachers were making it. So it was on a class based level, which is pretty awesome. Um, and we followed like a lot of the science. So I feel like 90% of what we did was like following the science of early childhood education. But then as I became an admin and I learned a little bit more of it, I re like we had, we had computers in all the classrooms from ages three and up. And what they had on the computers was like this edutainment garbage that was not not research based like in any way and it was good for the parents so this is where like selling the program came in because the parents wanted like technology you know based learning and and screens are important in this way and and you know kids should learn technology but it should also be educational and what they did was they slowly these two ideas and came out with this weird amalgam of like green time that was educational which it wasn't and it was just a waste of time um and and even like my regional manager was telling me like you know we can't be fully child-based and interest-led we have to follow our client too and like that i was like oh it like stabbed me no 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 this is this is a really that's another really what I said about before about us uh, the parents standing in the way of the change. Um, we are unwilling to have difficult conversations with parents. Like we need to educate not just the kids but the parents. And I know that that's like impo like. <sighs> Schools are already asked to do so many things, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah, like, it's like the kind of gutting feeling of like, oh, we're not actually doing what's best for the kids. Like that needs to be at the core of like your, your morals, like your ethics, like what are you here for? If you are advocating for children, then having hard conversations with parents is a part of your job. Yeah. And like, and you can like, and, and I guess, was it a private school? It was, yeah. So the idea is like, oh, you're gonna lose money. I disagree because if you are dedicated enough to like spreading the word about what you're doing and your commitment to kids, you're gonna find the parents that recognize what you're talking about. Um, but it was like they're out there. They did that 
but it was like on a tiered level. They were like, we know that most parents understand this, so we will advocate for this. But this is a little outside of their reach right now, so we're gonna put that on hold. Do you know what I mean? They weren't, like what you're saying, they weren't having those difficult conversations. They were like, everybody gets this, so the people that don't will help them along the way. But we're not going to be meeting with a lot of friction to make the money that we want to make, right? And the, yeah, that hurt. And I think that's one of like, here's the other thing too. It's like, so we have to deal, we have to talk with parents and we have to help educate them. But we also can't just like coerce them into believing what we believe. Do you know what I mean? We have to like, we have to slowly walk them along. And again, maybe we're talking about de-schooling here, but that's not, that's not an easy process if a, if a parent thinks that sitting at a desk is the proper way to learn and that you're looking for more of a play-based education system, you're not gonna be changing their minds that quickly. No, and this is, a, remember I told you that I, even though I have my master's in education research, I don't think, like, I learn stuff but it wasn't like this excellent program, right? I got that literally so that people would maybe take me more seriously. Mm -hmm. Because I have an arts education background, right? If I'm just like, I'm an art teacher and I believe this about academics, nobody gives a shit. Right. I've read like a bazillion books about parenting, even though I was like working in the disciplinary department, even though I've observed a bajillion classrooms and like, even use some of my vacations to like visit different schools, you yes. know, on maternity leave, like nobody cares about that. They're just like, oh, you have a master's in education research. Okay, now I'm listening, right? Like, same uh -huh. with like, if I were a white man that was like superintendent, they would be much more likely to take what the fuck I'm saying seriously. Um, uh -huh. That sucks. <laughs> um, but it, but I don't, Faceless to face, um, yeah, like the that's why you know, my sister is very negative, Nancy, about my social media use because I was like, I'm gonna change people's minds through TikTok, and she's like, Are you really? And I'm like, But you like, it's with unschooling, right? It's like the self directed learning. At least if like a random person on TikTok stumbles upon my idea, mm -hmm. that is to me is so much more potent than me going to a parent at a school and being like, this is why you should let your kid run outside for an hour after school instead of trying to drill more sight words. Yeah. Um, because you I don't. <laughs> so. It's really, really hard. Um, you know, may, like, again, schools can't do everything, but maybe they need, like, better PR, you know? Like, <laughs> somebody, like, even just the websites, you can't, you, it's so hard to, like, figure out what the fuck a school is about. Really? You know, like, all the mission statements sound exactly the same. Like, we are a place for joyful, high expectation, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't know shit about what happens day to day at your school <laughs> at all. Um, yeah, we need people who are, who are better at communicating and can like make the, the brain science of child development. And also another problem is like within the research world, all of the grants, uh, most of the, people that do grants for education research, they want to do things that they think will impact the most students. So they're not doing research on unschoolers, you know, this like, tiny fraction of the general population. They're doing it on giant public schools. And they're like only studying the things that would tweak the system within there. Um, Which is not helping us. Right. Um, but yeah, I think the more advocacy, the more we get the word out, you know, who knows? Maybe you get the attention of one of these ridiculous billionaires um, and they fund some education research on something that's not public school testing, right? Like, yep, that's...
thing that you were saying is like let's let's hoop in a mayor that's interested in like a democratic free school and hopefully you know maybe in some progressive town and then that takes off and like you know snowballs into a movement university that did like a lab school um that was like a teacher's college university um you know it's we need to do something well listen julia we are about at an hour right now um and i gotta run this conversation has been awesome um and thank you for your time and your daughter as well for being as patient as she possibly could be and, and, and adorable. Um, but yeah, it was thank you for your time. It's been awesome. And hopefully we can, uh, you know, share some of this with uh, people watching. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. And I can't, I, I have some friends that want the YouTube link when it's up. So. All right. Yeah, definitely. Sounds good. All okay. right. Take it easy.